Okay. Um, this evening, the topic is reconceptualizing Buddhist practice. Uh, and this is a concept, concept which Tendai Buddhism is well acquainted. And most other East Asian schools of Buddhism, with the exception perhaps of Hua Hian or Kegon, would not share this perspective. Next slide, please. <coughs> To begin, the reconsideration of Buddhist practice began in the 6th century CE with Qi Gi, the de facto founder of Tiantai Buddhism in China. And there are several ways to look at Buddhist practice. Uh, the first is practice most often refers to a specific activity such as meditating or chanting that one does, let's say, every day. This is indicative of doing a practice. A person practicing Japanese Nichiren Buddhism for instance, might recite the Daimokyu, the Japanese title of the Sut of Lotus Sutra, which is Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, every day as that person's practice. Many lay Buddhists maintain a home altar, caring for and attending to the altar is also considered a practice. Exactly what goes on at the altar varies from sect to sect, but most, of, most often it includes an image of a Buddha, candles, flowers, incense, and a small bowl for watering water offering and taking care of the altar is a reminder to take care of one's practice then there's the buddhist practice in the more inclusive context and this includes practicing the buddhist teachings in particular the eightfold path the eight elements of the path are organized into three sections wisdom ethical conduct and mental discipline and perhaps more specifically there is the practice of the six perfections or the six paramitas and the six are Dana, generosity, Shila, morality, Kashanti, patience, Virya, vigor, or perseverance, Dhyana, concentration, and Prajna, or wisdom. In this particular presentation, I'm going to talk about the four samadhis as the way that Buddhist practices were reconceptualized in the sixth century. The four samadhis are uh, Next, please. Oh, no, maybe not. No, you can go back. <laughs> go back, sorry. I was confusing myself. Okay, thank you. The four samadhis are elaborated in the comprehensive Mochi Kwan, which is considered to be the grand summary of the Buddhist tradition, according to Chi Gi's experience and understanding at that time. Mohi refers to great. Chi refers to Chan or meditation and the concentrated and quiescent state attained using that form of meditation. And Guan refers to contemplation and the wisdom attained through various practices. We also refer to it as uh, concentration and contemplation, or we might refer to it as, <clears throat> which is, is uh, the way Donner and Stevenson referred to it as, um, how did they refer? Stilling the mind and discerning the real. Yeah. Um, further, uh, and, and the practices found in this work are as relevant today as they were 1,438 years ago. Further, the Mochi Kwan and Makashi Kwan, as it is known in Japanese, is not merely an extensive manual or, or a specific means of meditation. It's an encyclopedic in its treatment of the Buddhist practices writ large. At the time Chi Gi gave the discourses from which the written work was gleaned, Buddhism in China was largely still greatly influenced by Indian Buddhism and represented a disjointed collection of philosophies and practices. Chi Gi's reconceptualization became the first unified system and the first truly Ekayana or one vehicle school. And we'll continue this discussion by using the four samadhi structure that was used in the Mochi form. Next, please. And the first of those is referred to as constantly seated samadhi. And constantly seated samadhi is lasts for nine days of motionless sitting, leaving the seat only for reasons of natural mean, need, meaning to get up and go to the bathroom, to sleep, to eat, that sort of thing. And this is what we normally think about when we talk about Buddhist practice, not necessarily sitting motionless for 90 days, but sitting meditation. In the minds of many Euro-Americans, seated meditation and Buddhism are synonymous. Though, as you're probably aware from our discussion, seated meditation outside of a monastic setting in South Asia and in most of East Asia is the exception rather than the rule. 
Jiggy embraced the Tiantai school as an antidote to, to Chan's focus on meditation to the exception of all else Buddhist in the sixth century China. Swanson writes in his article on Chan Chiquan Tiantai Chigi's view of Zen and the practice of the Lotus Sutra in the Journal of Tendai Buddhist Studies in 2007, quote, <coughs> further, Chigi and the Bodhidharma were contemporaries. There was no indication that their paths ever crossed. <coughs> There was no, quote, Zen school, unquote, in Chigi's time, at least not in the sense of the latter tradition that traces its lineage through Bodhidharma. Chigi's comments on Zen Chan referred to dhyana meditation or to an unidentified Zen masters who apparently taught a form of Buddhism that emphasized the sole practice of meditation and thus were criticized by Chigi as proponents of an extreme form of Buddhism. That's an un unquote to uh, Swanson. The emphasis here should be placed on the term soul practice of meditation. Yet here he begins his discourses with seated meditation. Clearly he was not dismissing meditation as unimportant. He is rejecting seated meditation as the totality of Buddhist practice. And as I say, seated meditation is a very useful way to establish a baseline for all the other practices, depending upon how one reads the Makashikan, this practice sets the stage for and conditions one to maintain other practices. Meditation is number eight of the Eightfold Path, number five of the six Paramitas, so it is assuredly very important. A regular seated meditation practice is very desirable, though it's not always possible and not recommended for everyone. Establishing a regular meditation practice if it is for 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 or five minutes, can contribute to one's overall Buddhist practice. Next, please. And I'm gonna be going through this fairly quickly to get a number of questions. The second of the four samadhis is the constantly walking samadhi, which is 90 days of attentive walking and meditating on Amitabha. This is the first phase of getting the Buddha off your butt. You might find it more effective to be more aware of your body during a walking meditation than a sitting meditation. When you're moving instead of sitting, and if you're paying attention, you'll feel sensations in your body, your feet repeatedly touching the ground, for instance, and perhaps the air going across your face. And this is the beginning of integrating one's dhyana with the world around you. During the retreat next month, hint, 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 July 9th, We'll be spending at least one session of meditating to kinhin, the Japanese term for walking meditation. One is still alternating between shamatha and vipassana, and, but one is doing it while moving. This is not the same as purely taking a walk in the woods, as restorative and calming as that may be. As can be seen from Jigi's instructions, he instructs one to meditate on Amida Buddha, Pure Land in China conducted circumambulation of Amida while reciting Nembutsu, which is Namo Midabu. In Chinese, it is a repetition of Abhitapu many times, and this is accompanied by a visual, visualization of Amitabha Buddha. The picture is of Chinese, the picture you're looking at on the screen is of Chinese monks walking in serpentine fashion while meditating. One of the things I want you to note compared to what I see happening in uh, the Hondo here, but in most places that I've seen, is note how close they are to one another. They are within a half an arm's distance from each other. Um, they typically walk first slowly, then a period of normal paced walking, and then increasing the pace rather quickly, finally a period of moderate back to slow walking. The distance from one another, the pace, the changes of pace, increase their awareness of the people around them and the environment they were in, all the while maintaining samadhi. As is indicated by Chigi's instructions, this can be done both with and without the chanting and the visualization of Amida. One can do other forms of contemplation, such as the verses we contemplate on, or another figure such as Yakshi Nurai or Kanabasatsu. Doing kinhin in the woods is quite all right, though it's more difficult because it's easy to be distracted by a squirrel running by, especially, <coughs> especially melodious bird 
on a branch or the smell of fresh pine needles. Again, this is great when one is taking a hike or merely strolling. However, the intention of meditation, by contrast, is introspective absorption until opening to the nature of absolute reality. Only the very devoted adept can accomplish both things at once. That is to say, looking at the things around them in the forest while being uh, attentive in meditation. You'll notice that each of the first two samadhis are given a 90 day duration. And that is, of course, in a monastic setting, and both the samadhis are accompanied by preparation of the space for meditation and specific ritual before entering, entering into the meditation. In lay practice, a less, less rigorous timetable is expected. You will note that the final two samadhis that we're going to talk about are not limited in time because we're slipping into the everyday category. Next slide, please. The third category is half walking, half seated samadhi. And this includes various practices such as chanting, penance, prayer, daily gongyo, or worship, reciting sutra, calligraphy, or other Buddhist practices. We see in this samadhi that one's Buddhist practice encompasses more than meditation. This was a direct response to the Cha'an perspective regarding meditation only previously mentioned. A monastic will be involved in such activities on a daily basis, in addition to meditating. These practices are expected to be done regularly, ideally once a day. But if one has children, working full time, juggling many obligations and duties, it can be difficult for a lay person. It is us useful to establish a schedule. So, for instance, meditating once a day for 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for the daily service, in another 15 minutes reading and reciting sutra for combined 45 minutes. If you can't do it daily, try every other day, etc. Attending the Wednesday evening gatherings is perhaps all that can be accomplished to begin, then adding other elements over time. Meditation is a method to uncondition oneself from the habits created by unwholesome desires, anger, and delusion. The starting point of Buddhist practice is to calm our minds and be mindful which means constantly remembering to be aware of how we're acting and speaking with others and how we're thinking when we're alone. We use meditation, first sitting meditation, to begin this process, then adding walking meditation to realize how to do it off the cushion. And at this point, we explore the wide array of Buddhist practices to reinforce and explain, expand the ways we bring our practices into the world. And in this particular area, half walking, half seated samadhi, is where we see such things I mentioned in the uh, that first paragraph, such as chanting is utilized. Think of the gongyo that we do on the daily service that we do. We start with um, um, sanrai, then we go on to uh, repentance, then we go on to uh, veneration of the sutra, the re recitation of the sutra, followed by various other practices. This is really, you know, we, we think of this perhaps not as meditation, but this is just as much part of the meditation as sitting with your legs crossed or sitting on a seiza bench. It's really the same process. And to sort of reinforce that is the notion that uh, Chi Yi considered this the third of the four samadhis. Uh, so doing calligraphy is, a, is really a wonderful uh, Buddhist practice because it utilizes much the same way as, as walking meditation and involves the body. Uh, so it's the, the body moving at the same time that one is concentrating. And uh, in the case of calligraphy, concentrating on the verse that one is, is uh, putting with with sumi ink to paper. Um, another form of meditation could very well be um, what we talked about uh, last week. You remember, well, I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. But the point being here that half walking, half seated samadhi indicates that samadhi meditation is done, it takes many different forms. So med meditation seated with legs crossed, for instance, is just one of a plethora of ways of doing meditation. Next, please. 
The final meditation that, that Chi Yi mentions is neither walking nor sitting samadhi. This includes the awareness of mental factors as they arrive in the mind. One is to contemplate them as not moving, not originated, not extinguished, not coming, not going. The last samadhi is carrying the lessons and methods one learns in the first three samadhi into the world moment to moment. And this is the most difficult of the four. This is where the most mundane tasks can contribute to awakening. You might recall last week when Kaiden mentioned that sweeping the floor in the kuri was even more efficacious to his practice than sitting meditation or words that effect. Is that what you said? Uh, I said that, I, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Yes. <laughs> when okay. people ask me for recommendations, that's the one I've got. Okay. <laughs> Uh, sweeping the floor, polishing the brass, washing the dishes, one imagines that they are wiping away defilements. Stacking cordwood, laying bricks, and cutting the grass, one can see one's action creating positive karma. In the mundane world, there are many distractions. We're now confronted with the three poisons, unwholesome desires, anger, and delusions that are unfettered. And by the way, when I say that we're now confronted, with, we, there are so many more distractions in the mundane world. I was thinking about even before social media and our iPhones, you know, compared to what it was even 20 years ago, before one had to look at one's phone to find out where one's mind was, um, it, it, it was perhaps a little bit easier than it is now, but it's even more difficult now. Um, we can't sufficiently prepare the environment we inhabit to protect us from these disturbances. And we can't control all the things that go on around us. So we must use our training in the previous three samadhi to guide us in our interactions with the phenomenal world. And this is what is meant by Buddhist mindfulness. I think that that term gets thrown around, mindfulness, that is to say, gets thrown around without reference uh, to what it's really you know, re referring to. Um, and, and just to expand on that just a little bit, each we, we, we mention quite often, for instance, when we're talking about the, the six parameters, that you know, we start with, with Dana and we go on to Sheila. We start with generosity and we go on to patience, for instance. Um, uh, not patience, we go, we go on to uh, ethical and, and morality. Um, we can start anywhere along there. We don't have to start with generosity. We could start with ethics or we could start with Dana. However, <clears throat> they're listed in the, in the order in which they're listed from, from generosity to uh, ethics and morality on to patience and to perseverance, etc. For a reason, and that is that in a very realistic world, one builds upon the other and they reinforce each other. And while it's nice to think, well, it doesn't really matter where I start, just start, which is absolutely true, in many ways, it's much more efficacious to do it in a particular order because then one builds upon the other. And so it is with the four samadhi. Chi Yi laid it out the way he did because seated meditation is actually the easiest of the Buddhist practices. You're starting with something which is easy. The last one is the most difficult. And so why start with the most difficult one? Um, Although I would find people would contend that sitting meditation is not the most easy, but in fact, it probably is. So when we're looking at these four samadhis, we, they are normally done in a particular order that is more effective. Though when we find ourselves having difficulty in, let's say, number three, we go back to one and reinforce the lessons we learned there so that we can then continue on and, and pick up further. And this is this last one is where the Buddhist practice of karuna, compassion, prajna, wisdom, and upaya, skillful means, become our real practice. By following the road map laid out for us by Chi Yi, we'll surpass all the methods that we employ to obtain the four Brahma Vihara or the four um, divine abodes of loving kindness, compassion, um, sympathetic joy, 
and finally equanimity in order to liberate all sentient beings. Next, please. In conclusion, I'd like to conclude by quoting Dara Lopez, <clears throat> the story of Buddhism, where he writes at the beginning of the chapter on the universe. The universe has no beginning. It is the product of karma, the law of cause and effect of actions, according to which virtuous actions create pleasure in the future and non-virtuous actions create pain. It is a natural law accounting for all the happiness and suffering in the world. The physical universe is thus the product of the individual and collective actions of the inhabitants of the universe. Buddhist practice is directly directed largely at performing deeds that will bring happiness in the future, avoiding deeds that will bring pain, and counteracting the future effects of misdeeds done in the past. And there are some who seek the ultimate goal of freedom from the bonds of karma and the universe it has forged." Unquote. So there are many parts to being a practicing Buddhist. First, it means that you have faith in the basic ideas or tenets that are at the core of what Shakyamuni Buddha taught. Secondly, it means that you are regularly and systematically engaged in one or more of the activities engaged in by Buddhist teachers. Next, though not finally, you gather with other Buddhists to learn, practice, and manifest the Buddha nature that resides within you. I trust the discussion has shed light on what it means to reconceptualize Buddhist practice. Next slide, please. What question that will unmute everyone? Ichishima Sensei, would you like to make any comments about the presentation today? Well, the uh, what types of meditation is? Uh, I think uh, this is a uh, uh, point of the Tendai uh, studies, and the G, as you mentioned. Uh, such four types of meditation he uh, indicated in his writings. And uh, actually, uh, this is sitting, walking, or non-sitting, non-walking, what everyday life. So <clears throat> meditation is a basis. Anyway, meditation is not limited in a particular form. Just uh, you can do it every time, everywhere, as you like it. The point is shamatha and vipassana, <coughs> coming and uh, discerning. So I think this is a uh, uh, basis of uh, any Buddhist practice, I think. Uh, this is what I thought now. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. I, I remember, I think it was in a newspaper article when Shumon and I were living in Japan in which you were quoted about doing the um, subway meditation hanging from a strap while oh. meditating while commuting. <laughs> do, do, you remember, do you remember that article? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A long time ago, yeah. <laughs> I think that probably got more eyeballs to read about meditation than anything else. <laughs> and I have to say that I practiced it quite often while in Tokyo subway system, although sometimes it was just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't we unmute everyone and, and uh, stop the recording? Uh -huh.